Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us at this uh, conversation with Neil Stevenson to talk about his new book, Termination Shock. Uh, my name is Ed Finn. I'm the academic director of Future Tense, which is a collaboration between Slate, New America, and Arizona State that examines the intersection of emerging technology with people and policy. So Neil Stevenson is a best-selling author, a string of bestsellers, uh, the, the kind of writer whose books are passed around in boardrooms and maker spaces and startup offices, uh, who coined the term metaverse in his novel Snow Crash, uh, in, in the Diamond Age, in a string of amazing books, exploring all sorts of topics from space exploration uh, and the future of, of the human to, in his most recent book, Termination Shock, the existential challenges of climate change and what that means for us as a species, uh, biologically, culturally, socially, politically, technologically. So I want to start by telling a little story about Neil and how we came to know him uh, about 10 years ago in one of the very first Future Tense events, which I actually wasn't present for, but I've told this story so many times that I really hope Neil doesn't tell me that I've got it wrong. Uh, uh, Neil was, uh, was, had recently written an article called Innovation Starvation, uh, which was uh, a reflection on how things worked out growing up, uh, watching the Apollo program, the National Interstate program, all of these huge, ambitious, global scale, long-term, positive visions of the future that were then built into reality, a set, of, a set of exercises in thinking big and then doing big stuff. And the, this essay was making the argument, we seem to have lost that thread. We don't seem to be thinking big in the same way anymore. And we seem to have a much more dystopian and antagonistic relationship with the future. And this is a real problem. And so uh, uh, Neil was there with ASU's president, Michael Crow at this event. And uh, Michael Crow, being the, the kind of guy he is, said, well, Neil, you know, maybe this is your fault. Maybe it's not that we have this uh, structural problem or that the engineers and the scientists and the entrepreneurs are, have lost their capacity to think big. Maybe what we need are better stories about the future. We need to rediscover our sense of optimism and our sense of hope about the future. And so that conversation struck a spark, and I'm so glad that it happened because one of the things that came out of it, well, two of the things that came out of it were Project Hieroglyph, which is this wonderful uh, collaboration and book project where we took that task to heart and tried to imagine technically grounded, optimistic stories about the near future. Uh, and it was the birth of the Center for Science and the Imagination, which became the institutional home for that project. And uh, over the years, we have continued to work with uh, Neil and a bunch of other amazing writers and uh, uh, researchers and all sorts artists, all sorts of people to create, to try to work towards this sense of inspiring optimism and agency around the future. How do we, and, and responsibility towards the future. So how do we change that collective relationship to work towards the world that we want to live in uh, rather than just freak out about <laughs> the worlds that we don't want to live in um, or throw up our hands and say, there's nothing we can do. So, uh, speaking of worlds, I want to bring, bring you in, Neil, uh, enough for me. I want to talk about world building. You are a celebrated master of fictional worlds, and every story is a microcosm, but your books are often straight up cosmoses, cosmoi, I don't know, richly detailed worlds that are their own immersive form of imagination. So I wanted to ask how you approach that craft. Do you have a philosophy or an aesthetic approach to the way that you build story worlds? Uh, is this something that you think about? Um, how, how, do you, how do you think about that, that, that part of your, that aspect of your writing? Well, I think you can uh, kind of divide my books into ones that take place in, in some version of our world. So don't really involve world building per se versus ones that actually do involve creating some kind of fictional world. So, so Anathem is an example in 70s. Those are both uh, books where, um, where a fictional world had to be created as part of the, the project. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, is a, it is a different process for be, uh, to be sure. Uh, you've got to have some idea of, of what's the, uh, I would say, what's the history of the the world that you're you're trying to build? Um, 
you know, uh, uh, I mean, to, to name a pretty, pretty off-sided example, um, Tolkien probably had to have the Silmarillion worked out in his head in order to create the, uh, the, the world that's, that's depicted in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, um, uh, just to, to know what the backstory was and to, to create the sense of historical depth behind the characters and places and situations that, that he was featuring in those, those books. Um, so, um, you know, it's all uh, a, a matter of trying to, um, I mean, at, at, the end, at the end of the day, what a writer's really trying to do is to, to foster and maintain the suspension of disbelief on the part of the, of the reader. Um, and so it, it comes down to, you know, what do you need to do in order to achieve that that goal, and um, in the case of a world building kind of book, um, what you have to do is give it some depth, give it a history, give it some background. Um, um, uh, one one way of phrasing it that that has kind of stuck in my mind is um, that I was talking to Richard Taylor, Sir Richard Taylor, who founded Weta Workshop that that um, did the props and the uh, the costumes and the weapons and so on for the Lord of the Rings movies. And he said his um, his basic principle that he tried to follow was to create the impression that if the camera were to pan around and look to either side of the frame, that the world that you were seeing in the frame would just keep on going forever. Um, and um, so that, that's as good a way as I can think of to encapsulate uh, what it is that you're trying to do when you, you write a world building kind of book. I really love that. And it reminds me of a bit from the, the comic comics author and sort of comics philosopher, Scott McLeod. He has a book called Understanding Comics, where he uses that, the reverse of that, the, the, the fiction that the world only exists where you see it. And then when you turn your head, it sort of disappears behind you. Uh, so it's a neat inverse of that. Yeah. And it, it also strikes me in the, the vision that you made that uh, that's, of course, easier when you're setting your story in our world. But of course, every time you fictionalize, you're, you're changing things. And you got me thinking when you, about the suspension of disbelief, because without getting into any spoilers, your new book opens with a really improbable moment. Uh, and you you sort of draw us into the storytelling through getting into explaining in, in great detail how this moment happened. And, you know, that th we, we know by the end of the, the opening section of the book, we know everything about why this moment came to be. Um, but how do you, how do you think about world building when you do have the world as it is? How did you approach the things you wanted to change for termination shock and extend out or build out from the present? Well, one of the basic decisions to be made from the very beginning was um, how far in the future to set the book, because clearly the farther you reach into the future, the more leeway is available in terms of uh, basically how much the climate has changed. And um, and and so you're you sort of are given leeway to imagine all kinds of lurid disasters and and, and relatively improbable uh, outlandish kinds of events that might happen. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking that approach. Um, but um, but it, you could think of that as a knob that you can set to whatever setting you want. And um, the decision I made was that um, I wanted to have the book seem more approachable to people who uh, aren't necessarily um, habitual readers of science fiction. Um, so there's a nice middle ground where it can be just a few years in the future and it can have enough kind of uh, if, uh, speculative material in it that a uh, science fiction fan um, will, will find it a, a fun book to read, um, but it's not so far out that, um, that, that readers of, you know, genre, you know, techno thrillers or whatever you want to call them would find it off-putting or, or weird. And I also thought that it was important to to do it that way simply because um, you know a part of what's going on in this book is is me trying to um, uh, to sort of get people thinking about the problems of, of climate change um, and uh, if 
if the book is set too far in the future, it's easy to read it as just a kind of escapist um, entertainment and not kind of take it as seriously. But if it's set in a world that's essentially the same as the world we're living in now with just a few kind of exaggerations, then hopefully it feels more immediate and gets people thinking about the problem in a more direct and immediate way. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I'm very interested in this whole question of climate futures and how we, all everything that I said about the future seems only to be more accentuated when we're talking about climate change because it's the set of global, incredibly complex problems that seem to happen too slowly and too quickly at the same time and that are vastly distributed and there's no one person you can point to and say, this is your fault or you can fix this. And so this must present some interesting challenges as a writer. How did you approach the, that challenge you set yourself of getting people to think through these problems um, and imagine potential responses? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things. One is that um, I kind of made a decision um, not to emphasize um, kind of outlandishly weird climate events, particularly um, the, um, um, you know, mostly what we see is, uh, is kind of a Hurricane Harvey situation that takes place in Houston, um, which is sort of something that happens every few years already. It's just, it's a little worse because sea level is a little higher and, you know, climate change has advanced a little more, um, but, um, um, I, I wanted to, again, I wanted it to feel sort of immediate and um, and not something that was a projecting way out into a, an outlandish future. Um, and then, um, you know, the other basic move I'm making in this book is, um, is positing a situation where there's one individual who does actually have a lot of leverage and a lot of agency. Um, in that he's made a decision um, that he's going to implement solar geoengineering just on his own. He's a wealthy Texan uh, who comes from a background in the oil and mining industry. Uh, he's got the know-how, um, he's got the will to do it. He's, he's got um, the land to do it on. And he just uh, makes a unilateral decision that he's gonna, um, that he's gonna take some action. And I think that is a way of um, making the whole idea hopefully feel more immediate and not just something that kind of dissolves into this welter of, you know, conferences and, you know, international um, organizations and, and debate. I'm thinking, Neil, back to the formula we came up with for hieroglyph, no hyperspace, no hackers, no holocausts. Yeah. And I'd, for, I'd forgotten that. Yeah. Yeah. What What do you think? I mean, is 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 that, is that something? Uh, your 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 main character is he? And I think by hackers we were also talking about plucky bands of outsiders, right? Uh, that not every story can be about the uh, improbable external um, ragtag potential dogs. force. Yeah. And I don't know. He. I. I. You're. I, uh, I don't think that Tr. The main character is. Is that? But I'm curious to hear what you think. And yeah, why, why was why was this a good uh, mechanism for getting into into the climate discussion? Yeah. Well, the um, I mean, so um, let's take those in order. So, you know, no uh, no hyperspace basically means let's um, let's have these stories be about real technology that either exists already. Uh, or could exist, you know, within a few years. Um, and um, so that's, I've kind of checked that box in this book by having the, uh, the, the geoengineering scheme be, be all based on science that we know and on- um, Love the detailed, you know, flyleaf illustration in the book of how, how the tech works. It's very yeah. satisfying to the, you know, the, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's all. Me. That's from uh, Weta Workshop Design Studio, uh, who just uh, did an amazing job with it. Um, the um, um, 
so and then um, the no hackers just means can we can we please get away from the the trope of the kind of ragtag band of counterculture uh you know uh people who are sort of um tweaking uh, the, the the essence of hacking is finding clever ways to tweak or manipulate a great big system great big powerful system that you didn't create um and that's a cool thing to do and everything but but at, at the end of the day if that's if that's what hacking is you're sort of uh you're always kind of an epa phenomenon um as opposed to being the phenomenon um and so um um in this case, again, the 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 guy who's implementing this uh, this device um, is building something new, and he's he's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from a ragtag counterculture figure. He's very much a stock Texan oil and gas <clears throat> billionaire who's using kind of very straight laced uh, engineering approaches to uh, and technology that comes out of the mining industry. Um, and then finally, the third one uh, was no holocausts, plural, which um, which just means, um, you know, can we get away from um, books that uh, derive the sort of an almost pornographic fascination from incredibly terrible things happening to the world? Um, the um, um, in, and and in this case, you know, there are certainly bad things going on uh, in the world, and I think. You know, if, if anything, I've been, I've been a little optimistic <clears throat> on that front, but um, uh, rather than um, just having everything just uh, turn to shit and be desperate and, and gloomy, you know, it's a, it's a, a case where one person uh, tries to do something which is controversial and perhaps ill-advised and other people react against it. Some people like what he's doing some people don't but basically geopolitics happens in what i hope is is kind of a realistic way it's neither a complete disastrous holocaust nor a utopian uh future yeah i found the geopol the geopolitical part of your story really interesting because i think part of what it makes the narrative appealing is this idea that, oh, there is somebody who can do something and can have a meaningful impact and who can take action. And then that, that action cause it precipitates all of these other things. It changes the geopolitical order effectively. Um, and I wondered how, if that's something you, you thought about, you know, do you see this? Uh, I'm curious to you, where, where, you, where your thoughts are on the whole question of geoengineering and mm -hmm. Um, you know, other other responses to climate change, you know, I'm, I'm not sort of invested in that particular term, but just what yeah. is what is large scale collective action look like? Well, um, I mean, just to review uh, what whenever we talk about climate change, we're really essentially talking about one number, which is the parts per million of CO2 in the world's atmosphere. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, that was in the mid 200s. Uh, when I was born, it was 320. And today it's 414. A year ago, it was 411. So that gives you some idea of how fast it's going up. <clears throat> right now, it's higher than it has been at any point in the last few million years. And you know, the last time it was this high, Earth had a very different climate. Um, so there, you know, the, the only thing really worth talking about is how do we get that number down again? And, um, and there's kind of two parts of that. One is to stop putting more carbon into the atmosphere, which is a great thing to do. Um, but, um, um, it's going to happen slowly. It's, it's probably, it's, you know, even under the most, um, optimistic projections, it's not going to be until something like 2050, 2060, something like that, before we reach net zero carbon emissions. So it's easy to perhaps imagine that if we could reach that point, then the problem would kind of resolve because that's the story that we have in our heads from past examples of, of air pollution problems, right? So in the 1950s in London, there was a terrible air pollution problem because of coal 
burning. And so they enacted a clean air law and the problem sort of went away uh, because the the smoke basically blew off, you know, the next time the wind changed and um, and 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 so the recovery was sort of free and automatic. Um, and similar things happened with smog in Los Angeles uh, or the the uh, the problem of the ozone hole disappearing. Um, basically, as soon as we stopped putting the bad stuff into the atmosphere, the problem is of nature corrected the, the, the problem. Um, those are bad um, analogies or, or narratives for thinking about the CO2 problem because um, uh, if we could stop putting new CO2 into the atmosphere, the amount of time that it would take for natural processes to bring the number back down to where it should be is on the order of a million years. Um, so, so it's not just enough to go to net zero carbon emissions, although we do have to do that, but we're also going to have to um, um, extract CO2 from the atmosphere, so-called carbon capture. We're going to have to do it on an unbelievably massive scale. So anything that we talked about in the hieroglyph project is, is trivial and, and completely dwarfed by the scale on which we have to do carbon capture. And um, um, and in the meantime, there's going to be this um, period, probably most of the 21st century, during which the CO2 level is just too high. And, and so uh, it seems likely that we're going to begin seeing um, uh, mass fatality events, um, such as uh, Kim Stanley Robinson very aptly describes in the first chapter of his book, um, The Ministry for the Future. Um, uh, and um, um, so, so what what's going on in Termination Shock is that this guy, my my fictional character, so if he gets all this and decides that he's going to take action to to bring the global temperature down through geoengineering um, long enough for um, for carbon capture uh, programs to be implemented uh, on a meaningful scale so and that thus thus endeth the uh the the dissertation um i'm disappointed that you don't travel with a uh a stand projector and, and a stick to, to to show us some of the charts and graphs i i um, do i i do i have a powerpoint that i've been showing at my book tour events yeah well i was about to follow up and say actually i'm i'm that's great i'm glad that you do because uh this is, it is a, a huge challenge that we need to contend with. And, you know, when we first started talking about climate future stuff at the Center for Science and the Imagination a few years ago, it really felt like the urgent challenge was just to get people to, to pay attention and to care about it, and to recognize it as a, a, a real and present challenge, that not some, something abstract or something that would get taken care of later. Now it doesn't feel like we need to make that argument anymore. The people, I agree. I think have come to come to accept that this is happening and it's serious. Uh, and so now the problem feels like, what are we going to do about it? And there are very few uh, compelling stories out there that offer people a sense of agency and responsibility that connect us in the present to some kind of future that we might actually want to work towards. So I don't, you know, just. I'm just going to throw that out there. Is that something that you think about? Maybe, maybe the way to to get into this is to think about: Do you see a role for fiction in addressing this crisis? Do, do the stories we tell about climate make a difference? Well, I mean, clearly, I, I've I've got some opinions about that, <laughs> given the the current book. Um, so um, I uh, I haven't made an effort to follow cli-fi, you know, climate fiction, um, largely because I've been working on a cli-fi book and so I didn't want to get tangled up with stories that other people were, were telling. Um, so I'm not well versed in that. I don't know what kinds of stories people have been, been telling. I think it's certainly easy to tell a, uh, a gloomy story, um, but, um, um, 
hopefully, you know, kind of in the spirit of, of the hieroglyph project, uh, people can can take other approaches as well and um, and and yeah, and and try to come up with visions uh, that are a little more encouraging um, and that might might help uh, spur people into some kind of constructive uh, action. It's it's hard because it's so um, slow and kind of diffuse and and, um, and you know I mean a lot of uh, the the proposals to begin doing something about it are in the realm of policy. You know, it's like how can we create financial incentives um, that will um, you know create a market or or some other you know uh, set of of, uh, of financial structures that will cause people to to spend money on this um and um you know that's just it's not as fun to to write about as aliens and rocket ships and blasters yeah it's it's really hard and this is you know mentioning uh kim stanley robinson's novel also becomes a centerpiece of his story as a new financial uh, a, a cryptocurrency that's a, basically a carbon coin that people can be motivated to uh, to stop producing carbon. You can get paid not to do things that are going to contribute to the to the crisis. So I agree. It's it's really hard to to get into the policy questions, um, but I think. You know, you 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 end up doing it in this story too, right? Because all of the the, the technological solutions end up being policy. Their their policy debates. It's it, there are some weird, maybe surprising analogies between this and the question of human activity in space. You know, we we have all of the technical solutions that we need to address this challenge right now. We will get better ones, you know, we'll get better, we'll get more efficient solar and all kinds of things. We'll maybe one day we'll have fusion power, but we know how to, technically we could solve these problems now, but, but it becomes a policy and a social question, just like we've known how to go to space for a long time. And the question becomes, well, why are we going to do it and who's going to pay for it? And what's the, what's the meaning of it? What's the purpose of it? So I guess, do you see that, um, that, sense of is, is I, well, I'm thinking about your, the, the, your writing and, and, you know, one of my favorite things you ever wrote was that great long article in Wired about transatlantic or, or uh, uh, ocean, oceanic cables yeah. uh, and this inter interplay between the stuff of the real world, the material fabric and industrial fabric of reality and how that overlays with our social fabric and information, uh, but also uh, economies and ideas. And I see a lot of that in this book too, the way that you talk about resource extraction and mining uh, and the, 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 the role that those industries played historically in causing a lot of this, this pollution, but also how in, inescapable they are for anything we are gonna do technologically to to build a different future. So I, I just, uh, is did, did you think about that notion of how do we change the things that we value? What do we, what do we identify as valuable or how do we, how do we, how do we change our, um, our value structures in order to invest in or buy into either economically or just sort of, um, in a, in a more, uh, uh, social way, how do we buy into a different way of doing things to deal with the climate crisis? Yeah, I, I would say that I did not think about it deeply. Um, that it's not that kind of book. And, um, so it's, um, uh, and so in, in that sense, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of dodging the, the central question a little bit. Um, is your privilege it, as the interviewee? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the, um, um, one of the, um, one of the interesting features of where we are right now globally as a society is the, um, the re reliance on billionaires to solve problems. <clears throat> so, um, problems that, um, 50 years ago, we would have solved through, um, some, you know, governmental body. 
uh, some other kind of large traditional institution, um, a lot of those don't seem to be getting solved um, anymore by those traditional institutions. And but uh, at the same time, we've seen the rise of um, of, of billionaires who are proportionally speaking, you know, incredibly wealthy, right? So it's not just that they're rich people, it's that they're you know, unbelievably rich um, and control a pretty significant fraction of the total wealth of, of the human race. Um, and, um, and so uh, it's become conventional now to kind of uh, expect that um, the Elon Musk's and the Bill Gates's of the world are going to tackle things like um, the space program or um, eradicating malaria or, or other things like that, that that used to be the, the province of, of large governments. Um, so uh, in this case, that kind of enabled me to bypass a lot of the detailed policy uh, and money questions that uh, are in the real world very important by just saying by fiat that I've got this character who's got a lot of money who just decides to single-handedly do this. Um, and I think it is realistic that an individual or a, a country might, um, might do some geoengineering because I think it's, um, it's achievable at a... Um, at the right price point, uh, it's not that hard. <clears throat> um, but I don't think that the same is true of carbon capture on on a scale commensurate with with what we need to 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 see. Um, so so for that, we're, we are going to have to find uh, ways to make it um, lucrative, for lack of a better term. Yeah, and. It, it, I bet geoengineering is, is interesting too, because I think there's a, a fairly narrow and maybe more uh, 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 pro provocative definition, which is about something like, oh, we're going to launch a bunch of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, but if you think about how much human activity changed in 2020 because of COVID and how it had a notice, noticeable impact on how much carbon we put into the air during those months when we all decided that suddenly it wasn't so important to drive into work every day. And no, we weren't going to get on an airplane to travel to that conference. That we're human activity is already at a scale that we're we're effectively engineering and manipulating every system on the planet. Um, so I guess and this, have been doing for thousands of years. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. Every every invasive species that we introduce, every yeah large uh, social decision we make, every new technology that takes off and becomes a ubiquitous tool in the human toolkit, these all have huge impacts. It's only now that we're beginning to recognize how, I think we spent a long time separating ourselves from, pretending to separate ourselves from natural systems. And now we've realized, oh no, <laughs> we're still part of them and they're part of us. Uh, I, I think there's a segue here, uh, when you were talking about how we solve these problems now to that to, to innovation starvation and the whole idea of thinking big. So it's been a decade uh, since you had that conversation with Michael Crow. Uh, have the stakes of that discussion changed, do you think? Uh, are we still facing the same fundamental challenges about how we imagine and build the future? Well, I think uh, one thing that's definitely changed is um, is the the various exploits of Elon Musk, which um, and not just SpaceX, but other things he's he's done as well, which um, are are kind of uh, in that spirit. Um, so um, um, so that's kind of a new wrinkle that didn't exist back then, and um, it you know um, in some of the remarks that he's made about what he's doing. Um, it seems clear that he's explicitly thinking of this. I'm not what I wrote, but just the what I wrote about, you know, the idea that, you know, why shouldn't we, why shouldn't we dig big tunnels under our cities? You know, why shouldn't we build a rocket that's bigger than the Saturn V? Um, so, um, um, so that's a new uh, wrinkle. Um, and um, I don't know, beyond that, um, I, I think, 
I, you know, changing changing the the mindsets and the behaviors of large institutions is is very difficult. They they basically don't change. Uh, they, for the most part, just have to be kind of superseded and absorbed, you know, uh, instead of, of, of being reformed and, and reprogrammed from the, the ground up. So uh, I don't know to what extent that's actually happening, though. Yeah, it feels like an interesting juncture in terms of the institutions that uh, are actually governing and uh you know what one the 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 reason i mean i'm not an expert in this but i think that the reason billionaires are people are empowered to make these decisions now is as you were saying because they are so much more wealthy and powerful that this this level of wealth disparity is 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 novel and really remarkable and coupled with this time where we have a, a, an incredible amount of technological agency to do stuff if you have the money the means the wherewithal to pull it off so they're, it's they're also they also tend to be unitary decision makers um mm -hmm. as opposed to you know um deliberative bodies um so there's all kinds of uh, uh mechanisms that have um been put into place um, basically as to react against past abuses or past you know failures um, that uh, that were were put in for kind of well-meaning reasons but um, have the effect of of uh, making things incredibly slow and sometimes uh, preventing things from happening altogether um, and so um, um, you know the um, trying to do anything ambitious and big in the world is is really hard, and uh, you've got to have not just the the capital on hand, um, but you've got to have the the talent uh, who can who can execute your plan. You've got to have um, you got to have an, an opportunity, uh, and all of those things are kind of ephemeral and, and kind of touchy. So. Um, you know your your investors may get skittish and decide not to invest or decide to to uh, fire you and put in new management and your um, uh, your talent may may wander off um, and um, uh, the the opportunity that that you're trying to um, strike at may be ephemeral you know if you have to spend six months or a year um, sort of uh, uh, satisfying um, due diligence or regulatory uh, requirements, the the opportunity may no longer exist by the time you've done all of that. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, I think that the ability of of wealthy individuals to just pull the trigger on projects like this and and begin doing things um, kind of gives them um, even more of an advantage than they have already. I mean, they already have the advantage of being billionaires, uh, which is a pretty big advantage. But but then, so multiplying even that is um, their their kind of ability to to move in a, a decisive way. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to your list is uh, even billionaires need to have the right story to tell about what they're trying to do, uh, and I'm reminded of. Another thing that you you said in the early hieroglyph days, which is that a good science fiction story can save you countless hours of meetings and PowerPoints because it gets everybody on the same page. And so that 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 makes me think of um, the, this question of the feedback loop between science and science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to bring up something that you may already be sick of talking about, which is they oh, I can't they, imagine what this might be. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you have no idea. No idea. Um, uh, you can get out your katana and try to cut through the wall at any time. Uh, in in Snow Crash, you coined the term metaverse, and uh, you must be having interesting feelings about how another billionaire and one of the world's largest companies has taken up your moniker. Uh, so uh, feel free to 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 talk about that example or not. But what are your thoughts on this feedback loop between science and science fiction? Um, and has this most recent episode, uh, you know, changed your thinking about that at all? 
Well, yeah, the, the interesting thing in the case of the metaverse is the uh, the time lag, which is about 30 years. Um, so um, that's pretty I mean, good in academic publishing. Yeah. Yeah. So I may I must have coined the term in something like 1989 or 1990 when I was writing the book. Um, so it's been that long, almost, a, um, well, you know, 30 plus years. Um, so um, and in that time, a lot of people have have looked at that idea and sort of uh, uh, with or without my influence have, have implemented various aspects of it. So in, in a lot of ways, it already exists and has existed for a long time. There's, there's massively multiplayer uh, games uh, that have been around for a while. World of Warcraft has, has uh, been around in its current form for, for a long time now and Fortnite is another very popular game where um, you're you're you know existing in a virtual world with 100 or 99 other uh, players represented by avatars. Um, so a lot of this stuff already exists and um, uh, is is being pushed forward. Maybe not under the the, the name of the metaverse, but you know it's, it's got the uh, the un, the same underlying technological requirements. Um, the, um, uh, the, the version that we're seeing um, uh, being shown to us by, by Facebook is, um, is uh, as, far, as far as I can tell, nothing particularly new. Uh, it's, you know, we're seeing a few people having a virtual meeting around a virtual conference table and sharing a virtual whiteboard. Um, and we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, two people who are far apart playing chess with each other and that kind of thing. And all of those have existed for for many years in other under other names. Um, so um, the, uh, I guess I would just suggest that we focus not on what they're claiming they're going to do in a few years, but what they're actually doing now, which doesn't bear much of a resemblance to, to the metaverse. Um, so, um, and, and, and ask ourselves if they maintain the same business model um, uh, in which, you know, very large numbers of people use the application for free and then their data is sold to um, unknown, you know, players, um, you know, what, how is that how is that going to make our society look given given the way it looks now um but uh do you have any thoughts yeah. on the good feedback yeah. loop yeah the feedback that? loop I, I kind of <clears throat> strayed from your question um the um um i mean i think it's real uh it, it's it, clearly it's a thing that happens sometimes i i wouldn't want to overplay the idea too much, um, but um, um, you know, I, I, I guess uh, I I can't really improve on the um, on, on the the thing I said years ago that you've already quoted, which is that um, uh, sometimes a story provides a, a vision or a narrative that a company can kind of organize itself around um, and so it saves a lot of uh, unnecessary communication. Um, so you can see this with um, with what SpaceX wants to do, which is colonize Mars. Okay, there is a very simple, clear vision. Um, the, um, you know, uh, in the 60s, the vision was put a man on the moon. Uh, again, very simple and clear. Um, in between, we had the space shuttle, which is, you know, develop a modular reusable launch system that can be employed to put payloads into low Earth orbit of various types um, to perform a range of scientific experiments and commercial applications, right? So that's a, that's a pretty long-winded and vague story that um, um, a lot of people uh, don't find very motivating. Yeah, and that became reflected in the very complex technical requirements that the space shuttle had to fulfill to meet many different expectations. 
Yeah. Uh, so I want to I wanted to transition over to take some questions from uh, the audience. I encourage you to put your questions in if you haven't already. Uh, there's some good ones in here. So this is one from Irina Asmundson. You write a lot about how people react to crumbling or flawed institutions. What's your favorite sci-fi or fantasy novel that shows healthy institutions? That's a that's a great question. Um, in that it's very difficult to answer. I uh, so like nothing's coming to my head right away. Um, part of it is I'm. I'm not that um, dedicated a reader of science fiction. I'm not as well versed in it, in the in the, the whole body of of work as you might um, as you might expect. Um, so I would probably pull up some kind of embarrassingly ancient uh, reference. Um, you know the um, the Federation and Starfleet and in, in Star Trek. Um, it, for the most part is portrayed as a pretty effective organization. I mean, occasionally uh, you might see a, a, a flawed, um, you know, commander or some kind of, uh, of conflict in, in the, the upper brass, but, uh, you know, it, it's generally the, the good guy and, and is portrayed as, as being pretty good at his job. Um, uh, so uh, I think that's a fairly classic example of a, uh, um, of a big institution uh, in science fiction that uh, that appears to work. I although, like that example. Sorry, go ahead, Neil. Although I just I, I'm remembering a a remark I heard about. I can't remember who told me this story. A friend of mine was saying that he had tried to get his uh, his uncle or something to watch Star Trek, the original series, and this this guy was like a Navy. World War II veteran or something, and and he was just he just thought it was ridiculous, and and so th my friend asked him, you know, why, you know, why why are you so like dismissive, you know, of this? Because I think it's pretty cool. And he goes, speaking of Captain Kirk, he said they would never let a hippie like that be in charge of a starship. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Um... I, I am continually amazed by how much Starfleet and Star Trek is still a big part of our, our collective imagination of a positive future. Uh, just like Disney's Tomorrowland, it's sort of just still there, you know, and it's it's still a territory that we we keep coming back to. Um, okay, well, we'll we'll go to a different wedge of the trivial pursuit pie here, Neil. As a student of history. Does this period remind you of any other periods? If so, what lessons can we learn from that or those periods? This is a question from Sean McAllister. I think um, uh, it's we're we're unfortunately kind of forced to to look at previous examples of um, of empires that uh, that went into decline. Uh, you know, I hate to say it, like for a long time, I was holding out hope that the United States was would sort of pull out of the nosedive and, you know, not not be in decline anymore. But it's it's really hard to um, to say that right now with a straight face, sadly. Um, and uh, one book I've been flogging um, on the book tour um, is uh, called "The Fate of Rome." Um, and um, it's, uh, and of course, I'm blanking on the, the name of the author, but it's a fairly recent book. Maybe somebody can, can pull it up. It's, it's about the role that played by climate um, change and, uh, and um, disease. Kyle, Har Kyle Harper. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, in the, the fall of the Roman Empire. And um, um, so he's, he's telling a, a pretty oft told well-worn story how the, the Roman empire declined and, and fell apart, but with new information um, about how uh, changes in climate and, uh, and disease, uh, which were sometimes interrelated phenomena, 
uh, contributed to that. Um, and um, and so the, the bit that I've been quoting from uh, is in um, 535, 536 uh, uh, of, the, of the, the common era, um, AD, whatever you want to call it. Um, there were some volcanic eruptions elsewhere in the world that led to cold conditions for a couple of years and, and crop failures. Um, and, um, and, and at the same time, through a sort of complicated chain of, of events, allowed the bubonic plague to escape from its reservoirs in Central Asian marmot colonies to the Mediterranean, where it just had unbelievably devastating effects. Like, you know, even by the standards of bubonic plague epidemics, this one was a doozy. Um, and um, um, so it's kind of a meditation on how um, if, if, there, if there's existing kind of structural weaknesses um, in, a, in an empire that uh, the shock of, uh, of a pandemic and the, the way that it, it saps the energy of, uh, of, of a country um, can can hasten uh, the, a process that was already kind of underway for other reasons. So that that's a pretty good one to to look at, I think. Yeah, it looks like a great, a really interesting book, and I hadn't heard that. I think there's been Annalie Newitz has a great book on looking at. I think it's called Four Cities that yeah. also does that, uh, exploring how these kinds of uh, external stresses can just be a tipping point for a whole uh, empire, political society, civilization. So uh, another question that uh, I'll, I'll share from, from the group is about uh, geoengineering, sort of real world geoengineering proposals to sp spray reflective aerosols into the stratosphere like Nathan Mirvold, uh, which I think is which I don't understand if that's different from what you proposed in the book. So maybe you can elucidate that. But or or you mentioned briefly the idea of putting giant mirrors in orbit somewhere or fertilizing the oceans. So this is a question for Mike Nelson. Uh, do you have thoughts on other uh, geoengineering proposals, or maybe what what led you to choose this one for the for the yeah. book? Yeah. So I'll I'll go in in reverse order. What led me to choose this one is that it's the simplest and most uh, straightforward. Uh, technique and nature has done the experiment for us over and over again with volcanic eruptions. So um, the um, there's variations on the theme. Um, uh, the the ones that uh, are, I associate in my mind with with Nathan Mirvold's work are um, um, different ways of delivering the sulfur to the stratosphere using balloons or what have you. Uh, and, and ideas are sort of a, a fundamentally different idea called cloud brightening, um, where you just have ships, fleets of ships that shoot uh, seawater into the air and create mist, um, create clouds, artificial clouds that just because they have high albedo, they're, they, they bounce back a lot of the sun's, <clears throat> the sun's light. Um, <clears throat> another, <clears throat> another way to reduce the amount of uh, <clears throat> sunlight entering the, the atmosphere is, is space-based solar geoengineering. Um, there's a, you know, space geeks will know that there's these points called libration points or Lagrange points in space. Um, there's five of them in any two body system. So if you're looking at the earth sun system, there's L4 and L5, which are off to the sides. And then there's one, two, and three and L1 is simply in between the Earth and the Sun. It's where the, the gravity uh, of those two bodies balances out. Um, and so uh, by definition, it's directly between the Earth and the Sun. And so if you put any kind of uh, mirror or absorbing uh, object there, it's gonna stop some of the light that would have otherwise continued and hit the Earth. Um, and it's kind of stable. It's it's a meta stable. Um, uh, it's an unstable equilibrium. So basically, if the thing drifts too close to the sun, 
the sun's gravity gets stronger and it falls into the sun. And if it goes the other way toward the earth, it falls into the earth. So you've got to expend some energy to, to do station keeping, but still it's a pretty stable location to put stuff. And so one idea that's been discussed is, is you know, trying to launch um, um, some kind of objects that would, that would kind of unfurl they'd have to be lightweight, but then they would have to uh, expand it, you know, like a, a, a fan or an umbrella or something um, to block as much light as possible. Um, I think we'll have time for one last question, which uh, I wish I'd asked you in the, in our conversation as well, something that I really liked in the book was your discussion of performative war which I won't contextualize again so that we're not doing any spoilers. Uh, but Phil Saunders asked about that. It felt it was really interesting and imaginative. Uh, others have written about this, but didn't have ranking systems and betting lines. So maybe you could dilate a little on performative war. And is that something that you see becoming more commonplace in, in the near future? Yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it, it means something like, um, <clears throat> um, uh, it's a way of reducing the, the body count and the amount of damage done in a conflict um, by moving things out of the realm of World War II style, World War I style, you know, ad advancing and, or retreating and into the realm of, of kind of what we would might call psyops. So how do you affect the psychology of, of the enemy to, to make them um, uh, capitulate? Um, and so, um, um, and uh, on one level, it's kind of uh, derided as being sort of something that savages do or that primitive people do, which is a, a fair a fair point. But um, on on the other hand, um, you know, it can have the net effect of um, of keeping the body count lower. So if you look at World War One, for example, um, uh, you know, a lot of people died in that war, and it, it would have been preferable if we could have found, you know, like, what if we had two champions? What if Hector and Achilles had gone out and fought each other instead and only one of them would die? Um, so performative war is just a term for that kind of thing. And um, I, I'm, you know, uh, again, sort of avoiding spoilers, I make some use of it in the, um, in the novel, um, in a kind of modern context and um it's uh it does exist now we see it when when uh when we had the shock and awe attacks in baghdad that's an example of it uh when um and, and, and terrorist attacks um you know are, are attempting to do some of the same thing you know they're the the, the body count uh the damage done uh, might not be nearly as high as what you would see, you know, in a typical day on the Eastern Front of World War II, but um, but somehow it's calibrated in a way to affect people psychologically um, much more strongly than um, than old school uh, trench warfare did. So it's just I, I thought it was an interesting way to. Um, uh to to put some action and some some fighting and some combat into a book uh without having it just turn into a bloodbath yeah and it seems like it's going to have interesting intersections with disinformation and already has uh, uh when the performative war is not just about the battle of the champions but convincing people that actually some much larger piece of the fab fabric of reality is different, you know, and you have the footage to prove it. Uh, so some really interesting threads there remind me of, of one of the uh, plot lines in your novel Fall as well, um, the events around Moab. Um, unfortunately, we have to stop there on that really uh, positive and heartwarming note. Um, but uh, as always, Neil, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Congratulations on this book. I uh, encourage everybody to go and, and check it out. Um, thank you uh, for your time, everybody, for joining us today. And if you're not 
racing out to capture some carbon yourselves, you should dial into next week's event on December 8th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, is China canceling the internet? Speak, getting back to our question about um, empires rising and falling. Um, so thanks again. Thank you, Neil.